Good morning. I, I arrived here when the Institute was a toddler, a three-year-old toddler, and it clearly became immediately evident that this was a, an institution that fostered collaboration, interaction, creativity, imagination, which are ideals I've tried to follow throughout my entire career. But I'm here now to answer this question, what will survive longer, uh, Lambda CDM or the IOA? I have an answer, if I have two answers, and, um, but let me, for those of you who are not uh, cosmologists, just remind you that the standard model of cosmology is based on two key ideas that came about when I was a PhD student here. One of them was the idea of inflation uh, uh, that predicts two important uh, um, features. One is that the universe should have a flat geometry, and secondly, that it should be seeded by Gaussian adiabatic perturbations of quantum origin. That's the first idea, and the second one so, of course, the idea that the dark matter consists of non-baryonic, uh, called weakly interacting particles created soon after the Big Bang. Now, so the current incarnation of this model is Lambda CDM. And, um, and so, uh, where does Lambda come from? Well, it was first inferred in the 1990s when many people realized that the universe did not have critical closure density in mass. Uh, and, uh, and the inflationary imperative of zero curvature then immediately led to the idea that maybe there was a lambda. Uh, and then really the first direct evidence came from the large scale uh, uh, clustering studies with the APM machine of George, Hefstathew and collaborators. Uh, but it became widely accepted when the accelerated expansion of the universe was discovered in 1998, for which the simplest explanation is lambda. Now, so the great thing about this, and what really began cosmology, is that this is a fully specified model which has predictive power and can therefore be tested, it can be in principle ruled out. And it's made a number of predictions. It could have already been ruled out, and maybe it has, I would come to that in a minute. Um, but it's been immensely successful to the extent that it has earned three Nobel Prizes in physics since 2006. What I mean when I say <coughs> it's well specified, it's a power spectrum of uh, fluctuations. I'm gonna try pointing here, I never, no, I'm gonna point here. Uh, the power spectrum of fluctuations, uh, is very well determined, say, at the epoch of recombination. Inflation predicts a power law, but during the radiation era, fluctuations don't grow uh, uh, as much as they might. And in the case of cold dark matter, we have a power spectrum that um, uh, has a cutoff on the scale of the mass of the Earth, roughly. But if the dark matter was not cold, if it was hot or warm, because these particles free stream, there would be cutoffs in the power spectrum. So, uh, but the great thing is that these possibilities can all be tested with astrophysics, and uh, the way to test them, of course, is, or in full generality, is by using computer simulations. And that's a topic uh, that goes back 40 years. These are some of the first simulations. And uh, uh, here, uh, in, in the 1990s, uh, 1980s, rumor had come across the Iron Curtain that the Russians had measured a neutrino mass of 30 electron volts. Uh, which would give omega matter equals one, but it became immediately clear that that experiment had to be wrong because the universe of neutrinos like that wouldn't look anything like the universe as we knew it then, uh, whereas a lambda CDM model looked a lot more like the real thing. So this was the first success of this predictive part of these theories that we could conclude that the lubim orbital experiment had to be wrong. But what really enshrined lambda CDM as a standard model was the uh, this um, wonderful sequence of experiments that led to the Planck power spectrum that George showed the other day. And this really is a truly remarkable achievement, not just of cosmology, the whole of physics. And uh, when I get poetic, I say it's one of the high points of human civilization. The green curve is a, uh, uh, <coughs> a theory that pre <coughs> predated the observations by 20 years. Uh, and uh, here's this wonderful agreement uh, with that theory. And then been a lot of work uh, since then, uh, getting increasing um, amounts of data and simulations, uh, comparing a simulated world on the right here to real surveys. And uh, this is now culminating with a new generation of um, surveys uh, uh, on Monday, which seems a hell of a long time ago. Uh, uh, Andreu von Rivera and Licha Verdi talk about DESI. And I'm gonna remind you a bit of what they said and add something to it. So, it's a wonderful picture that they didn't show. I love this one. Of course, this is 
so that the main funders are the Department of Energy, so they can afford to do this kind of thing. But um, Licha and Andreo told you about the uh, barium acoustic oscillations and how they provide a very useful tool for cosmology because they are a standard ruler uh, whose size we know in centimeters. And so we can use this to track the evolutionary history as they describe uh, the expansion history of the universe. And because DESI has um, um, a number of traces at different redshifts, uh, all the way from local, all the way to quasars at about redshift 2, uh, then we can, in fact, uh, measure or track the expansion history of the universe and do some pretty uh, uh, powerful cosmological tests. So uh, the first results from DESI and uh, dark energy were already shown by Licha and Andreo. Uh, I'll just remind you, DESI stands for dark energy survey instrument. So uh, to uh, answer to DOE, we need to talk about dark energy. And the first thing you tell them is that uh, it's a very weird thing because it has negative pressure. So you could write an equation of state. Uh, uh, and um, this makes me nervous. Let's try this. Uh, write an equation of state like this, where W is the equation of state parameter. The simplest case corresponds to minus 1. That's the cosmo Einstein's cosmological constant. But there's no reason it should be constant. So if you let it uh, vary, sort of almost Taylor expansion, uh, with two parameters, W0 and WA, A is expansion factor of the universe, you can test to see whether this uh, dark energy is evolving or not. And uh, here are the constraints that Andrea and Leach show you. Uh, the uh, uh, DESI data alone don't do much, and, uh, but when you combine them as you should with the CMB Planck data, then another data, then you find that the standard lambda CDM model is incompatible with the data 2.6 sigma which may not make you lose any sleep. However, when you add more data, the degeneracies, every data set has different degeneracies. When you combine them, you break some of those. And when you add supernovae data, then you find that depending on which particular data set you prefer, then uh, the model moves farther and farther away from the Lambda CDM model, which is here. And the um, biggest exclusion here from DESI year five supernovae data is at 3.9 sigma. So the... Uh, now, so, depends what your attitude is to four sigma deviations, and uh, that's just not a scientific, but a psychological conclusion you would draw from this. But I want to give you further evidence in favor of this W0, WA uh, dark matter. And that comes from another of the main motivations, oh, sorry, well, I just told you this, comes from one of the main motivations of this in the first place, which is to uh, try and uh, measure the sum of the neutrino masses. And... Uh, the, uh, now, again, the neutrino mass affects the expansion history of the universe, and therefore you can set constraints on the sum of the neutrino masses. And um, you can do that even without DESI, just from the CMB, for similar reasons. Uh, and uh, in the case of the CMB, you have this big degeneracy between uh, the sum of the neutrino masses at the expansion rate. So we're actually measuring the expansion rate. Uh, but in the case of the CMB, you only got one measurement at high redshift, and so you set the limit like this. But um, as soon as you include the DESI uh, BAO measurements, that breaks this degeneracy, and now you get a much stricter uh, uh, limit of 0.072, which is very exciting because uh, neutrino uh, atmospheric oscillations give you a, an upper limit of 0.06, so you could say we must more or less measure the neutrino mass. True, but this is in the context of lambda CDM. Now, when you start digging behind this, you begin to get very worried because um, here's the posterior distribution here in red <coughs> of the, uh, some of the neutrino masses. And the first thing you notice is that it peaks at a mass of zero. And the prior in this calculation is that the neutrino mass should be positive. So the first thing they teach you in base school is if your posterior depends on the prior, then you should be very suspicious. So, and we were very suspicious. So in a, uh, a paper that came out last week, by, led by my uh, postdoc, Willem Melvers, we said, well, let's relax the prior. Let's introduce an effective neutrino mass, which if it's positive, we'll interpret as a neutrino mass. If it's negative, we'll just interpret as some parameter of the model that has no physical significance. And then we can do the calculation properly and see what the posterior looks like. And the results are quite interesting. And here is, if you then relax that prior, here's what you get for the posterior for lambda CDM. It peaks at a negative mass, uh, and, uh, which is not very nice. But more worryingly, 
it's in conflict with the upper limits from the neutrino oscillations. It's too, for normal ordering and inverted ordering, it doesn't matter. The main thing is that it's inconsistent with neutrino oscillations at more than 2.0 sigma. If you now look at the W0, WA CDM, then the posterior looks a lot better. It peaks at positive values. You see perfectly consistent with neutrino oscillations. And the limit is now greater than we had before, but at least everything is consistent. And so in my mind, this uh, kind of uh, uh, semi-independent of the W0, WA from the direct measurement of the expansion history. And um, you could see, well, this gives you further evidence that maybe there's something not quite right with lambda CDM. So, well, if you take this seriously, you say the IOA is already won. Lambda CDM is ruled out. Uh, and, um, but, um, and actually, this result came after I proposed the title. So, uh, <laughs> so but is this really the answer? Well, George and uh, Licha, uh, who I don't think is here. No, she's not here, but George is here. They, they, were, they were really very skeptical about this. So now I'll just remind George that uh, the last paper that the DFW collaboration wrote, we used to be called the Gang of Four, in 1992, uh, commented, uh, wrote a paper called uh, The End of CDM, already 40 years ago. It was really a discussion of the APM uh, clustering studies and other things. And we said, and George signed up to this, these problems can be avoided by appealing to a cosmological constant um, but uh, the value of lambda needed to work these miracles is extraordinarily small, 10 to 120 times smaller than its natural value. Such fine tuning seems sufficiently unattractive uh, that most cosmologists regard this solution as a long shot. Now, George signed up to that, but... <laughs> All right. I thought I had, but anyway. <laughs> All right. So, so, yeah. Right. So, now... However, I've always considered lambda as kind of an accidental thing. It's just to get the curvature equal to zero. So I, I, I never liked lambda. I don't like it still. So I'm not wedded to lambda. CDM, then you're talking. CDM to me is a lot more um, robust and it's something that um, I think uh, has not yet been ruled out, of course. And I want to now spend some time telling you about that. So let me replace lambda, if lambda is not the answer, by x whatever is responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe, and um, rephrase the question like this, with a focus on CDM. We're now then uh, to test CDM on these scales, we need to go to the nonlinear regime, and, um, which is the regime of galaxies and clusters. And the key statistics here are the uh, abundance of halos uh, uh, or the galaxies and their internal structure. And these de properties depend very, very weakly on lambda or x. So you can do clean tests of CDM not worrying about the expansion of the, what's causing the accelerated expansion of the universe. So there are four problems. Some of you, those, I'm sure all of you who work in this subject, are aware of the small crisis of lambda CDM and how it become apoplectic every time I need to talk about this. So I decided not to talk about it, just list uh, these supposedly four problems that afflict CDM on small scales. They're all really fake problems. Uh, and uh, they, they, in fact, some of them, uh, Oh, sorry, and a fifth has been added recently. I do want to talk about this, uh, but these four problems, many of them were solved before they became a problem. For example, the missing satellite problems were solved in 2002, and it only became a problem 10 years later, and so on. So the answer here is that these problems are solved by binary effects, uh, and this plane of satellites is just a question of being able to do statistics properly. I'm very happy. Uh, but I do go apoplectic to give you any details you want. I have reams of slides on this. Uh, uh, but I don't think we should worry about them anymore. But let's worry instead about these galaxies discovered by JWST, a great large redshift, which I think is very exciting. So, um, oh, before that, I just to say that the key to why there's no missing satellite problems and so on goes back to Martin Rees's thinking, which um, uh, to do with cooling arguments. I don't have time to go through this in detail if you are interested. Uh, there's this paper a few years ago, which basically restates what Martin already knew uh, 50 years ago, and that is that uh, this is redshift, this is the halo mass today, and there are two thresholds that a halo mass has to overcome to make a star, uh, depending on whether this happens before or after reionization. So this you can work, work through these calculations, but this is the important result, that um, you can plot the fraction of halos that host the galaxy, 
as a function of mass today. And what you find is that all halos with mass uh, uh, less than 3 times 10 to the 8 uh, over here, they're all dark. All of them are dark. There's a majority of halos. Most CDM halos have never been near a baryon in their life, uh, whereas all halos about 3 times 10 to the 9 are vis visible. And this is the answer to missing satellites and so on. Right. So let me now focus on this, which I think is very exciting. So we had a very nice talk uh, by Stephen Finkelstein on these galaxies at redshift 8 to 15. Now, there's many papers, several papers on this, and they all have this sentence, uh, which I find very intriguing. We confirm uh, the conclusions that bright galaxies at this epoch are more abundant than predicted by most theoretical models. So well, maybe, what, what do you mean by most? Maybe there's one that's right. Uh, and actually, I know the answer. <laughs> Uh, and I'm shocked that the referees let this through. All these models are based that they compare with are based on simulations that have neither the resolution nor the volume to tell you anything interesting. The only one that comes close is one called Flares from the Eagle collaboration that does have the right resolution and enough volume. So this is not surprising, but it's a theme that recurs time and again. Here we go again. Uh, nearly all theoretical predictions, and it's not just uh, them. Uh, the other authors do the same thing, and uh, even in nature, would you believe it? And um, here, uh, they're difficult to realize. And uh, here, the, the, uh, the, um, the skepticism of Latin CDM begins to creep in, and there's this paper with one of the best titles I've ever seen, The Impossibly Early Galaxy Formation Problem. Again, in CDM, it's not supposed to happen. Now, so here's the data that uh, Stephen uh, showed on uh, Tuesday or Monday. Uh, here are UV luminosity functions at Richie 7, 9, 10, uh, 12, and 14. So that's the data. Now, uh, in the blissful world, they were not aware, uh, Finkelstein or any of them, uh, that in 2018, five years before JWST, there was a paper published with, the, with a very subtle title, Predictions for Deep Galaxy Service with JWST from Lambda CDM. Um, anyway, the point was that we made an effort to make sure that the simulations we had had enough resolution and volume. You cannot do that with hydro simulations. You need to use dark matter simulations and something called GALFORM, which is an analytic model of galaxy formation that we've been working on for 30 years at Durham. Now, just a word about the philosophy of these semi-analytic models. And, uh, the point is that, of course, they have parameters, and you fix those by requiring agreement with the whole range of important statistics at redshift zero, luminosity functions in various bands, and so on. So the model parameters are then specified at redshift zero, and then you hope that when you look at high redshift, they will model won't work, so you learn something you didn't know before. Now, a key uh, thing about GALFORM, it's been around since for 20 years, is that if you want to understand the number counts of millimeter galaxies at 850 microns, you cannot do it unless the IMF is top heavy. And we've been living with this for 20 years. It was very controversial originally, and then gradually, uh, uh, now when I say this in public, I see members of the audience who are experts nodding in agreement, both theorists and observers. So uh, I think this is no longer a very controversial uh, a statement, but it is key to what I'm going to tell you next. So here are the data from Finkelstein and others. And um, we just took GAL from out of the box. Well, it's not a box, it's a disk. Uh, computer disk and run it. Changed nothing. Uh, and here's the answer. There's two versions of GANFORM. Let's look at the solid line. And it's perfect agreement, well, perfect, beautiful agreement, all the way to Redshift 12, where uh, we can no longer, we cannot explain these very bright uh, 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 galaxies here at Redshift 12, and at Redshift 14, we fall below. So I said, well, great, we're going to learn something. Until I realized that the universe is really young at this epoch. So, of course, mod dust is a key part of these models, otherwise you couldn't explain uh, the luminosity function of some millimeter galaxies. And then I started wondering where dust can form uh, within 300 million years of the Big Bang. So I went and read an article by Roberto Maiolino and, and, uh, and um, what's her name, Schneider. And, um, and indeed, they have models that dust is beginning to form. No, it's slightly controversial, but we then said, well, let's, let's get rid of the dust. Uh, and then, then you account for these. Uh, uh, you even overestimate uh, these ones at Redshift 12. But there are models that um, are in the literature, one from that paper by um, uh, Schneider 
and, 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 and Roberto, others, and they're shown here by the green and orange lines. So the minute you take the dust into account, then, uh, then everything falls into place. And so uh, I think I'm very pleased with this result. Uh, they are in the paper that we put out on AstroPH uh, just a few weeks ago. And um, I think there's nothing wrong with lambda CDM at high redshift. On the contrary, uh, if I'm in a different audience, I wouldn't do that here. I would take this as another success of CDM, but I won't go that far today. Instead, uh, I just want to show you some properties of these galaxies, namely, which observers don't have access to. They're all in small halos, uh, around nine, uh, three, a few times 10 to the nine, almost independent of the UV luminosity. And we can do one thing. Oh, and this is the line, uh, the threshold. That you remember, I showed you the three times 10 to the eight solar masses below which all halos are dark. Um, and uh, we can do something that observers cannot do, uh, which, well, we can do many things they can. Uh, uh, these ones, what are these? Well, they are, in fact, dwarf galaxies. At redshift 12, the brightest one is like Fornax. Uh, and at redshift 16, the brightest of these galaxies are just slightly bigger than a globular cluster. When people talk about massive galaxies, they're not massive. They're just bright. <laughs> and they're bright because they have a top-heavy IMF. Uh, anyway, so we can do things observers can't like see where would they end up today, their descendants. And um, you see here that uh, depends whether they're satellites or centrals. At redshift zero, you can find uh, centrals are uh, in halos bigger than the Milky Way. Uh, satellites could be in bigger halos. There are, uh, these uh, JWST galaxies are the satellites of clusters and groups. Uh, the stellar masses, if satellites uh, can be as small as 10 to the 7, for the centrals, they're really the bright population of galaxies today. So what Finkelstein and others have discovered are the progenitors of galaxies like the Milky Way and brighter, as well as many of the satellites that we see in galaxy clusters today. Right. Now, so as I said, uh, I think it's just as predicted. Uh, anyway, so let me now uh, come back to the question, well, how can we actually test CDM? on small scales. Can we do it at all? And yes, we can. And I think this is a test that will happen soon uh, because we know the halo mass function of uh, halos. And uh, yeah, of course, the halo mass function is of halos. Here it is uh, plotted from a recent paper by these characters, uh, Folkers here in the audience. And uh, it's a power law and then it has a break. But this extends all the way to the mass of the Earth, which in so incarnations of CDM, where the cutoff occurs. I, I find this plot very impressive for a computational cosmology um, uh, uh, project because the uh, 24 five orders of magnitude on both axes. But we know now the number of halos to perfection in CDM. And um, how do we test this? Well, uh, for, well uh, for example, if the dark matter was warm instead of cold, then we would uh, not have any of these huge number of small halos. There's the cutoff <laughs> that I mentioned earlier due to free streaming. Now, uh, here is a movie that um, I cannot play, but it shows you, uh, I don't know how to play the movie, but anyway, it doesn't matter. It shows you the difference between the Milky Way halo in cold and warm dark matter. So uh, now looking at visible galaxies is not gonna get you very far distinguishing between these two because the visible galaxies, as I said before, only form in this part. So you really gotta be able to count the number of darks of halos. There are various ways to do that. Uh, one is looking at streams, like Dennis was talking about yesterday, or he didn't talk about that. But just very briefly to finish off, I want to tell you a technique that I think should work, uh, and that is looking at distortions of Einstein rings produced by gravitational lensing uh, by these moles of structures, which lens as much as the main uh, lens does. So here are these Einstein rings, wonderful things that nature has given you. But if you have a structure, the ones we're interested in, uh, near the lens, then that would produce a uh, perturbation in the Einstein ring. And here's an example by Simona Vegetti and Leon, I'm sure, who's the father of this subject. I just saw him, Leon Koopman, must be an author of this. The trouble is, if you see it by eye, this perturbation then is not interesting because it's big enough that it's not probing the regime we want. Now, my uh, 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 colleagues in Durham, uh, we have found already two, uh, both using ALMA and JWST. Uh, but again, they're not really in the interesting mass range. But uh, I am told by my postdoc, Chuan He, that we can, in principle, with these techniques, and we have tried them, detect halos as small as 10 to the 8 solar masses. And um, if Wernamari is right, we shouldn't find any. If CDM is right, we should find lots. And we know exactly how many. So I think this is the test that will definitively 
tell us uh, whether or not CDN is the answer. So I'm come to my conclusions then. The uh, uh, great precision of DCBAO indicates lambda CDM is formally ruled out at 2.6 to 3.9 sigma. An evolving dark matter model is favored, a conclusion that's strengthened if you uh, do an analysis of the uh, limits on neutrino mass. On small scales, the abundance of JWST galaxies at redshift less than 14 is, I would argue, as predicted in lambda CDM, uh, and distortions of strong gravitational lensings are the way to test the other end of the theory uh, at the CDM end. So, will, uh, what will survive longer? XCDM or IOA? You wonder what these characters are doing. Uh, we're spelling out CDM, and uh, this is way back in 1987. It's a Labour Party poster there. I won't say more about that election, but uh, I'm glad the world was put right uh, in the last election. So what is the answer? I have an answer. And the answer is, this would be a really good title for a talk <laughs> at the 100th anniversary of the IOA. And let's talk here. Okay.